Hello and good morning to all of you out there. I'm Bob Rogers. I'm the executive director of Coside Land Trust. I was on our board for 17 years prior to being uh, elected executive director to replace Joe Chamberlain, who was enjoying a well-deserved retirement. I may have met many of you in one or more of our previous in-person events or webinars. As our relatively new executive director, I would like to welcome you to the Coside Land Trust free community webinar series. The Coside Land Trust is dedicated to the preservation, protection, and enhancement of the open space environment, including the natural, scenic, recreational, cultural, historical, and agricultural resources of Half Moon Bay and the San Mateo County Coast for present and future generations. We are a nonprofit organization working hard since 1997 to safeguard our scenic bluffs, open space, stream corridors, and agricultural lands. From the southern city limits of Half Moon Bay, north through the community of Montera in San Mateo County. Taking a strategic approach to land conservation, we protect land by purchasing and accepting donations of land and conservation easements. We secure private and public funding for land conservation, and we provide assistance and resources to landowners interested in protecting their land. And we lead conservation, restoration, stewardship, and educational activities. And every day we remain dedicated to protecting our coastline and our future. As members of our community and valued Coastside Land Trust supporters, we ask you to make choices that support our organization and our important work. This can be done by donating through our website. Other easy ways to donate are through plan giving of assets and land through wills and living trusts, vehicle donation, gifts of stock, or tribute gifts. Also showing up for work days and passing along our message and our mission. The important part here is that we all do our part in whatever way we can to help protect and steward our shared open spaces. Thank you for joining us here today. And it is my pleasure to turn it over to Kate Dickey, our social media coordinator, to tell you a little bit about our presenter. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Bob. And thank you all for joining us here for this free community webinar series. I hope that the series will allow you and all of us to learn from the breadth of, of these esteemed and relevant environmental uh, vantage points, each geared towards educating us about the living world and our connection to it so that we can know more and make choices that support caring for the environment on local and global levels. Um, today, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Raina Bell. She is the Associate Curator of Herpetology at Cal Academy. Uh, she has a PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology um, with the University of, uh, with Cornell University. Uh, she's got a, a humongous list of, of educational background. She was a chancellor uh, with Chancellor's postdoctoral fellowship at um, Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. Um, she was the curator of amphibians and reptiles at National Museum of Natural History. She's done an, an enormous, uh, enormous amount of work internationally, both in Central Africa, um, South America, and now also in Caribbean as well. Um, but she's here today to talk to us about it give us a kind of an overview of reptiles and amphibians and what we've learned and some of the things we may have mislearned. And then she's going to be zooming in on our local, some of our local reptiles and amphibians. So Dr. Bell, thank you so much for being here. Are, are you ready to get started? Yeah, let's get started. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So yes, today we're going to have sort of a broad overview of the spectacular diversity of amphibians and reptiles. And then I'm going to zoom in on just a few of our local species, um, in particular, focusing on ones that you might have a good chance of, of seeing in the wild if you're interested in that. So, let's see. Okay. Um, so despite what all of these pictures suggest, I actually did not love up growing, grow up loving amphibians and reptiles. Um, I grew up here in Marin County. Um, and really, this interest in amphibians and reptiles started when I took a herpetology class when I was a student at UC Berkeley, um, getting my bachelor's degree in biology. And this was really the first time that one of my college professors was emphasizing what we do know versus what we don't know 
about the, the subject material. And so rather than just sort of memorizing everything in a textbook and thinking that scientists have already figured everything out, he was really emphasizing the things that are still being discovered or where our understanding is still deepening um, with respect to the biology of amphibians and reptiles. And so one example that really stood out to me um, was in one lecture, he noted that over 100 new species of frog are described every single year. And this has been going on for decades. And in most cases, when a new species is described to science, we don't know very much about their basic biology, let alone whether or not they're declining or threatened. And so this was really the first time that I realized as a student how much we still have to learn about our planet, even about really conspicuous and charismatic animals, some of which are right in our own backyards. And so after that herpetology course and getting involved in biology research as an undergraduate student, I went on to graduate school where I started studying African frogs. And now I'm fortunate to be part of the team at the California Academy of Sciences that curates and studies one of the world's most significant collections of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and so there are thousands and thousands of species of amphibians and reptiles. And this morning, we're just gonna cover some of the basics about these two groups of animals that herpetologists study. And then I'll share some details about some of my favorite species from right here in the Bay Area. So to sort of give you an overview of where amphibians and reptiles fit into the tree of life. Um, so here we're zooming into the vertebrate tree, the vertebrate part of the tree, which includes fishes and other animals with backbones. And then we have the tetrapods, which are the animals that are the, the vertebrates that have uh, four legs. And then if we zoom a little further in, we have the amniotes. And these are the, the vertebrates that have the amniotic egg. And then um, if we zoom in a little further, then we have the, the reptiles. And so the study of herpetology is a little bit funny because if you're looking at this tree, you're thinking, okay, well, there's mammals in here and birds, and those all seem to be closely related to amphibians and, and reptiles, but they're not part of the study of herpetology. Um, and so really, herpetology is kind of this funny mix of lizards and snakes, turtles, crocodilians, dinosaurs technically are reptiles, and birds are also technically reptiles, but those are studied by a completely separate group of biologists called ornithologists. And then we have the amphibians that are in a separate part of the tree and sort of the mammals are splitting amphibians and reptiles from each other. But of course, mammals are not part of herpetology. We have mammologists who study mammals. And so why do we have these amphibians and reptiles excluding birds getting lumped together into the study of herpetology when it doesn't really make biological sense in terms of a grouping. And so this is just sort of a historical legacy that dates back to when biologists were first coming up with a classification system for all living things. And this was way before Darwin. So before uh, biologists had a concept of evolution and evolutionary relationships. And so the relatedness of, of plants and animals wasn't really an explicit part of this classification system the way that it is today. And instead, biologists were organizing things into categories based on how they looked and maybe where they lived and other aspects of their lifestyles. And so in this sort of mess of, of biodiversity and trying to lump things, amphibians and reptiles got lumped together as the sort of non-bird, non-mammal vertebrates um, that are these slimy, creepy, crawly creatures. <laughs> and that legacy has persisted until today, where we have um, a group of biologists that I guess like the creepy crawly things, and I guess I'm one of them. So amphibians, um, this is a, a group that's been around for over 300 million years on the planet. Um, and this is, as of yesterday, the current number of species that are described in each of these three main groups of amphibians. And these numbers change on a weekly basis because new species are being described to science all the time. Um, and so 
The three main groups that we have of amphibians are the frogs and toads, which are the most diverse. We have over 7,600 species currently described to science. And then we have the salamanders and the newts, of which there are over 800 species. And then this third group called Sicilians, which if you've never heard about these until today, I'm sure you're not alone. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, but this is the least diverse group of amphibians. There are just over 200 species of these. So this is a little quiz for you and you don't have to put your, your answer in the chat. You can just um, write it down on a piece of paper or just think in your head which one. But um, a common challenge for folks or a common question that I get is, what is the difference between a frog and a toad? And so here's a little quiz for you, whether you think the frog uh, A or the frog B is a toad and which one you think is a frog. And um, so I'll give you a second to think about that. I promise there is a picture of a frog and a picture of a toad on this slide. So again, no one's checking your answers, but you can be honest with yourself of whether or not you got this right. Um, so the frog on the left is actually a toad and the one on the right is not a toad. Um, and if you are caught off guard by this, um, don't worry, it actually is kind of confusing terminology. So there are many, many species that have the word toad in their common name, but that are not actually toads with respect to the biological definition of a toad. And so all of these different species on the side here have toad in their name. So we have spadefoot toads, Suriname toads, fire-bellied toads, pumpkin toadlets, the midwife toads, burrowing toads, and even this species of lizard in the lower right whose common name is horny toad, but of course it's not a toad, it's not even an amphibian, it's a lizard. Um, and so these are all species that they have in many cases sort of similar body shapes. They're kind of stumpy and they have um, bumpy skin and maybe these sort of like big beady eyes. And so they kind of physically look similar um, and they kind of look similar to the, the typical toad that you might be picturing when you're picturing a toad. Oh, and I do have the Suriname toad is a very unusual frog that um, if you don't like lots of small holes next to each other, which is trypophobia, maybe avert your eyes for a minute and I'll tell you when it's safe. Um, but this is a species that actually the, the little froglets develop under the mother's skin on her back and then they sort of hatch out of her skin. And that's what this little gif is, is showing here. So it's a pretty, amazing but also somewhat horrifying um, strategy for reproduction. Okay, so the, the trypophobia is gone now. Um, okay, so why do we have this confusion? Well, from a, a scientific standpoint, toad means a very specific thing. It's referring to a type of frog in the toad family, which is called the Buffonidae. And this family Many of the species do have this sort of stereotyped toad body shape that we all picture when we think of a toad. So this, again, kind of stumpy body shape and bumpy skin, and they tend to be species that spend more time on land than spending time in the water. Um, but that's not what technically makes a toad a toad. What makes a toad a toad are these three characteristics that are indicated by the arrows here. So. They don't have teeth on their upper or lower jaws. Um, they have this special gland behind the eyes called the parotoid gland that has uh, poison in it. And then they have this special organ next to the kidneys called the bitters organ. And so they're all species that are most closely related to each other that are in this family called the Buffonidae. And they have these three characteristics and that's what makes a toad a toad. And in, in this family, although many of the species are these sort of typical toad-looking frogs, um, there's over 600 species, and they're actually very diverse. And so 
many of the species are living on land and living in these drier environments and have that thicker bumpy skin, but there's also a bunch of species that live in the tropics and there are species that live up um, in trees or in bushes, like the one that I tried to trick you with in the quiz. That's a really small um, little tree toad that lives in Central Africa. Um, and then we have species that are really colorful and that you maybe wouldn't recognize as being a toad um, if I hadn't just told you how to tell them tell them apart. Um, so that's that's the toad family, the true toad family. And toads are just one family in more than 50 families that are known from frogs. And so frog is sort of the umbrella term, umbrella term and then toad is referring to a specific kind of frog. Um, and so there are more than 50 families of frogs and thousands of other species. And these include things like tree frogs and glass frogs, reed frogs, tailed frogs, dart frogs, uh, rain frogs, and wood frogs. And sometimes species that look really similar to each other are closely related, and sometimes they're not. And that's because frogs have adapted to live in many different kinds of environments and their body shapes and their colorations tend to reflect their different lifestyles. And so sometimes we'll have species that are in very different families that will look very similar to one another because they've adapted to a similar lifestyle or habitat. And this is called convergent evolution. And so one of these interesting sort of shared characteristics has evolved uh, many times in frogs is related to the way that they reproduce. And so as you probably learned in school, many species of frogs start out their life as tadpoles, right? So they lay their eggs in water, tadpoles hatch out of the eggs, and then those tadpoles will undergo metamorphosis and turn into a miniature version of an adult frog. But there are tons of exceptions to this general rule and documenting all the variation and how it's evolved is a major area of research in amphibian biology. And so some species will build these protective nests for their eggs to develop in. Um, so like these foam nests on the left by these uh, tree frogs in, in Central Africa, or we have these mud nests or volcano nests that these frogs in South America will build. And in both of these cases, they're putting the eggs inside of these nests where they will develop, and then the tadpoles will hatch out. We have some species that will carry their developing young around on their backs, like these dart frogs, where the males will carry the tadpoles around on their backs and move them around into individual small pools of water where they will complete their development and turn into a miniature version of an adult frog. And then the species on the right is called a marsupial frog. And this is the female here. And she has these specialized pouches on her back where she will store the fertilized developing eggs and they'll complete their development in her little pouch. And then little baby froglets will, will emerge. Um, these frogs might not look particularly remarkable. They're just little brown frogs, but the species on the left is a toad from West Africa um, that will give birth to fully formed froglets. Uh, so it's a live bearing species of frog. And the species on the right is from Southeast Asia. And these are species, um, they were described to science pretty recently and they give birth to live tadpoles. And then the tadpoles will complete their development um, outside of the, of the mother. And then the final version um, that I'm gonna talk about this morning is these species that completely skip the tadpole development stage. They're called direct developing species. And so they will lay their eggs on a sort of damp soil. And then the tadpoles will develop or sort of the equivalent of the tadpole will develop within the egg and they'll complete their development and then a miniature version of the adult frog will hatch out. Um, and so this is a strategy that has evolved independently multiple times in different tropical groups of frogs. So lots of exceptions to the sort of standard tadpole to metamorphosis development that we all learned about in, in school. 
All right, I could talk about frogs for a while, but we have a lot to cover. So we're gonna move on to our next group of amphibians. Um, so similar to the terms toad and frog, you might've heard the terms salamander and newt and not known exactly what the difference is. Um, and so similar to the term toad, newt is referring to a specific kind of salamander. And so specifically, these are species that are in the subfamily, which is sort of like a subset of a family called Pleurodelini. And all the species in this subfamily have this distinct terrestrial and aquatic phase in their life history. So they have a, a period of their, their life cycle where they're spending time on land. And then they have a period of their life cycle when they're returning to water for breeding. And when they do this, each time that they make that transition, they undergo some physical changes um, so that they can be better at swimming when they're in their aquatic stage and be better at hanging out on land when they're in their uh, land, land living stage. Uh, and so this is a species here that's showing you some of the subtle differences in sort of the physical appearance of the individual depending on which phase it's in. And many of these newts also are toxic or poisonous. Uh, and so in, in the biological world, many species that are toxic are brightly colored to warn predators. And so many newts um, are also brightly colored. And so this, this was something that I learned in my herpetology class that was sort of unexpected and, and cool, I thought, which is that North America is actually the global hotspot for salamander diversity. So we tend to think, oh, if you want to see a lot of biodiversity, you have to go to the tropics. And that's true for many groups of plants and animals. But North America is actually the most diverse place in the world for salamanders. Um, so we have about 25% um, of all the global diversity occurring here in North America, and nine of the 10 families of salamander also occur here in North America. And I'm just going to tell you about a couple, or one cool species. Um, so the first one is this, or the one I'm going to tell you about, sorry, is this um, Mount Lyle salamander from the Sierra Nevada, California. And we tend to think of salamanders as being very slow moving and um, kind of, you know, maybe not the most fierce of animals for those of you who haven't seen them. Um, and so this species is in the family Plethodontidae, which is a really interesting family because they lost their lungs at some point in their evolutionary history. And so they exclusively breathe through their skin. And in losing their lungs, they sort of freed up some of their inner anatomy to be able to do other things. Um, and this is a video that demonstrates what one of those amazing things is that they, they've they been able to evolve. So here we're looking at this Mount Lyle salamander. Um, and this video is slowed down a hundred times, but if you do the math or if you speed it up in your mind, um, this is ballistic tongue projection. And also you probably realize that tongue is very, very long. And so because they've lost their lungs, they've opened up all this space in sort of their chest area and the, the muscles and things that are associated um, with the lungs to be able to have this incredibly high speed tongue projection that they use for capturing their prey. Um, so I think that's just a really amazing evolutionary adaptation. You had probably heard about ballistic tongue projection and chameleons, but I bet that you didn't know that salamanders can do it too. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the third group of amphibians, which is the Sicilians. Um, and if you've never heard about them until today, I'm sure you're not alone. Um, so at first glance, they maybe look more like a worm or a snake. Um, but they have backbones, so they're not worms, um, they're vertebrates. And even though none of them have legs, they're descended from a tetrapod ancestor that had four legs, and they're most closely related to frogs and salamanders. Um, so there are only a few hundred species that have been described to science. And as you saw in the video, 
they like to burrow underground, so they have pretty secretive lifestyles. Um, there are uh, some species that are aquatic that, that spend their time in sort of murky streams, but most of them are burrowing underground. And so because they have these secretive lifestyles, there's still a lot of very basic information about their biology that we don't know yet. Um, but this is one of the better known species, which is the Sao Tome Sicilian. It occurs on this one island off the coast of Western Central Africa called Sao Tome. And it's brightly colored and it's very abundant. And so everyone in Sao Tome knows them very well. And this is a photo that I took uh, from a research trip in 2015, where this female that we had caught um, gave birth to these two little babies overnight in, in the container that we had her in. So this is a live bearing species of Sicilian. And in fact, many of the Sicilians give live birth. Um, so again, just maybe challenging some of those things that you might have learned in school that, that mammals are special because they give live birth while many amphibians also give live birth. All right, um, so zooming in specifically to some Bay Area species of amphibians um, that you maybe have already seen or that you have a good chance of seeing if, if you like to hike a lot. Um, so we have a few species of native newts in California, including the California newt. And these newts have toxins in their skin, um, so they're pretty bold. And so you might see them just out and about crossing the trail if you're out on a hike in a more forested sort of humid area. Um, but one of the easiest ways to see them is it, when they're migrating to ponds to breed in the winter. So sort of starting right around now into, into spring. Um, and this is really cool because if, if you are near a breeding pond, you can see large numbers of newts sort of migrating, making their way to the pond and then hanging out and mating in the water. Um, and so some places where you can see this are Tilden Regional Park and the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden in, in the Berkeley Hills um, and several parks in Santa Clara County. And um, so if you check your local park uh, newsletters or websites, they're very likely to have resources about, about when and where you can see these really cool breeding migrations. Um, and newts are a species of special concern in the state of California, um, which means that they are declining or at risk. And one of the big challenges for newts is because they have this migration as part of their life cycle, um, if there are things like roads that have heavy traffic between their breeding ponds and the habitats that they're using for the rest of the year, um, then they might get snatched as they're making their, their yearly migration to those ponds. And so several regional parks have made efforts to close the roads down to car traffic during this part of the year when the newts are migrating, uh, which I think is a really effective way to, to give these newts the boost that they need to make sure they're able to complete their, their life cycle. All right, um, another one of our local amphibians are the California red-legged frogs. And these are actually our official state amphibian. Um, they're pretty large. They can get up to about five inches. And as the name suggests, they have reddish legs and bellies. And this species, um, they've experienced really severe population declines across the state of California due to loss of habitat primarily. And they're officially listed as threatened by the US and California governments. And so they do have formal legal protection. Um, but luckily in the Bay Area, we actually have very healthy populations. And because of their status, I can't tell you exactly where you should go to find them um, because that's um, somewhat protected information. But you're very likely to encounter them if, if you do like to spend time hiking. Um, and because of their size and that red coloration, they look very different from our other frog species. So if you do happen to cross paths with them while you're on a hike, it should be pretty easy to identify them. They, they won't look like the other frogs that you'll be seeing. And then the third local amphibian I'm gonna tell you about are the Western spadefoot, spadefoots. Um, and so this is one of those species that maybe looks a bit like a toad, but it's not actually a toad. So they live in drier habitats and they spend most of the year underground in burrows where they can enter this sort of dormant state that's called torpor. It's sort of the, 
dry equivalent of hibernation. Um, and so when they're in this dormant state, they're conserving their energy and conserving water and basically waiting out the really dry part of the year. Um, and so they get their name Spadefoot from these structures on their feet called uh, spades. So it's sort of this little darkened black area on sort of the heel of the frog there. Um, and it's keratinized, so similar to your fingernails. And this structure helps them dig their burrows because they're digging these burrows that they're gonna um, sort of hibernate or estivate in. And these burrows can be quite deep, uh, which is, it's pretty impressive. These little frogs are digging these deep burrows all by themselves with these little spades on their feet. Um, so they're more of a drier habitat species, but they do occur in the Bay Area in Eastern Alameda County, sort of at the very edge of the Central Valley. Um, and the, the best time of year to see them or hear them, which is true of many amphibian species, is when they're breeding, um, which is during the winter and the spring. And this is another species of special concern in California, again, primarily because of, of habitat loss. All right, so now we're going to transition to the other half of herpetology, which is the reptiles. And I won't be talking about birds or dinosaurs today. So just like with amphibians, new species of reptiles are being described to science on a regular basis. Um, and if you like keeping up with this sort of thing, um, there's a website called the Reptile Database that keeps track of this. And for the amphibians, there's a website called Amphibia Web that keeps track of this. So if you want to have the most up-to-date information on exactly how many species there are in each group, those are the places to check. Um, so we're going to start with the most diverse group, the Lepidosaurs, which is the Tuatars, the snakes, the lizards, and the Amphisbenians. And then we'll also talk briefly about turtles and tortoises and alligators and crocodiles. Um, but one important misconception that I think is worth clearing up about reptiles is that even though they're called cold-blooded, reptiles are actually capable of having very warm body temperatures. And they do this by basking in the sun to warm up their bodies, right? So differently than birds and mammals do by metabolically generating our own heat, they get their heat from the environment. And I think this clip of marine iguanas in the, in the Galapagos demonstrates this really nicely with some thermal cameras. So this is a, a group of marine iguanas sitting out on the rocks together, basking in the sun. And the thermal image is going to show sort of, this is early in the morning, how things are looking, um, where the cooler, cooler parts of the landscape are gonna be the sort of blues to purples. And then the warm parts are going to be yellow and orange. And so initially it's just the rocks that are really hot and orange, but throughout the day as the, the marine iguanas are basking, they start to heat up. And so you can see that very quickly um, they're getting just as warm or maybe even warmer than the rocks around them. All right, so now that we've cleared up cold-blooded, um, maybe you could even say that reptiles are warm-blooded a lot of the time, depending on what time of day. Um, we're gonna chat very briefly about tuataras. So tuataras, they look a bit like lizards. They maybe even look a bit like an iguana. Um, and they're not technically lizards, but they are the closest living relatives to lizards. And so tuataras are sort of the last remnants or the last descendants of this group called the Rhychocephalia that were sort of at their peak in the Jurassic and the Triassic when they were much more diverse. Um, and the only remaining species today are the tuatara, and they occur in New Zealand. Um, so they're super interesting animals because they're sort of the last descendants of this, this group that has otherwise gone extinct. Um, and so they have very unique biology and, and life history and sort of represent this really unique part of the tree of life, sort of of our planet's history. Um, and one little factoid I'll leave with you is that they are incredibly long lived. So they can live over 100 years. All right, 
So now we're gonna move on to the rest of the group, um, which are the squamates. And this group includes the lizards and the snakes and the amphisbenians. And many of the species in this group don't have limbs, um, but it's not just the snakes that are limbless. So limb loss has evolved many different times in lizards and also in this other group called the amphisbenians. So amphisbenians or worm lizards as they're called, um, they're kind of like the Sicilians of the reptile world. So a lot of them are, are mostly burrowing. They don't have external ears. They barely have eyes. And there's similar to Sicilians, there's a lot that we don't know about them still because they're spending so much of their life underground. Um, so again, most of the species don't have limbs, but of course biology loves exceptions. And so there's this species on the right called bipes. Um, that actually has very well-developed forelimbs, so front limbs, which is what the little arrow is pointing to, but it's missing its hind limbs, um, so kind of like a, a mermaid, maybe. <laughs> and yeah, these are, these are very interesting and unusual animals. Okay, so if you didn't know about limbless lizards, maybe you're thinking, how am I supposed to tell the difference between a snake and a limbless lizard? Um, well, the, one of the easiest ways is the ear opening, um, which is going to be present in most lizards, but absent in snakes. So if you can get safely get close enough to look at the head, um, you should see a very distinct hole behind the eyes that is the ear opening in uh, lizards, and then you won't see a hole if you're looking at a snake. And then another way that you can usually tell them apart is that most snakes have these wide scales on their undersides that look very different from the scales that are covering the rest of their bodies. Um, so these ventral scales. And lizards will usually have the same kinds of scales on both their ventral and their dorsal sides. So both the belly and the rest of the animal will have very similar size and shape of scales. Um, and then lizards also will typically have movable eyelids while snakes do not. And as you're probably familiar with, snakes will typically have more mobile jaws so that they can swallow large prey. And even though snakes are famous for eating really large prey. Not all snakes do. So this is a sea snake called the turtle-headed sea snake from Australia. And this is actually a very um, venomous species, or it's in a very venomous family of snakes called the elapids, which includes the mambas and the coral snakes and the cobras. Um, but this species is pretty unusual in that it, it eats fish eggs. Um, so it's not eating particularly um, fast moving or well-defended prey items. It's just eating fish eggs. So speaking of venomous snakes, um, I mentioned earlier that toads and newts and some other frogs are poisonous. And you may have heard that you're not supposed to use the term poisonous for snakes and that they are venomous. Um, and so the, the difference between poison and venom is that poison has to be eaten or ingested by the potential predator to have an effect while venom is injected into a potential predator or prey item to have an effect. So toads and other poisonous frogs have toxins in their skin for defense against predators um, like this poison dart frog. And many snakes will have venom glands and specialized fangs to inject their venom into other animals. Um, so that's, that's the difference between poison and venom. And again, biology loves exceptions. So there are some exceptions to this. Um, and this is a species of keelback snake that has special glands in the neck where they sort of store the poison that they get from eating poisonous toads. And they also have venom glands um, where they can inject venom. So this is a snake that is both poisonous and venomous. 
And although it's mostly the snakes that are venomous, some lizards are venomous, including the beaded lizards um, in North America, which we don't have them here um, in the Bay Area, but they occur further south. And so these are lizards that they use their venom for defense rather than for immobilizing their prey. Um, and they are, yeah, you, you still probably wouldn't want to be bit by one, um, but it's, it's not going to be as intense as some of our more venomous snake species. All right, so now on to turtles and tortoises. So again, similar to frog and toad or newt and salamander. Um, sometimes folks aren't sure what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. So a tortoise is referring to a specific kind of turtle. Um, and these are species that are in the tortoise family. And in this family of uh, turtles, the testudines, they, all the species are um, live on land, they have these domed, high domed shells and kind of these stubby um, feet that look kind of like elephant feet. And so these are the species like we have in California, the desert tortoises, um, and then the Galapagos tortoises, Aldabra tortoises. So many of the species that you're thinking of probably for uh, tortoise are indeed true tortoises. Um, but then there are other families of turtles that have some species that have similar body shapes to true tortoises, like this box turtle. Um, and again, the reason that they have a similar body shape is because they've evolved and adapted to living in similar habitats. So these tend to be uh, turtle species that are spending most of their time on land, um, as opposed to species that are spending most of their time in water. So turtle is the umbrella term and tortoise is referring to a specific family of turtles. So there are only a few hundred species of turtles around today, um, but they do occur in all sorts of habitats, including freshwater habitats, um, the oceans, deserts, and temperate and tropical environments. So this is just a little sampling of some of that diversity. And again, you can see the, the tortoises have those sort of stubby elephant looking feet and the, the ones that are spending their time in water tend to have more flipper looking feet. Um, and so I mentioned there's only a few hundred species of turtles around today, but because of their unique body plans with all of these hard parts, they have a really extensive fossil record. And so there's a lot of research happening on fossil turtles that were around millions of years ago and that, that aren't around anymore. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this particularly cool species from Australia um, that is called Ninjamese. And it was named in honor of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because um, it's a very sort of defended looking species. If you, I don't know if you can tell, but the tail kind of looks like a, a club with spikes on it. Um, so yes, <laughs> and then last but not least, we have the crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and gharials. Um, so this is not a super diverse group. There's just a few dozen species of these around today, and they're most closely related to birds, if you remember back to that sort of tree of life, which that might seem a little bit unexpected, um, but they do actually share some interesting traits with birds like providing extensive parental care to their young. Um, so that's, there's a lot of really interesting research into the, the behavior of crocodilians. And of course, I can't talk about alligators and crocs without mentioning Claude, um, who is a fan favorite at the Academy. And if any of you have been to the Academy and asked yourself whether or not he is real, he is real. He just, he doesn't move very often. But if you're patient and you watch him for maybe five or 10 minutes, you will see him move. Okay, so here are just a few of the amazing reptiles that you can see right here in the Bay Area. Um, so leatherback sea turtles are the largest sea turtles on the planet. 
and they occur in all of the world's oceans, literally all of them. So they have one of the biggest distributions of, of any species. Um, unlike other sea turtle species, they don't have hard external shells, and instead they have these small bony plates in their skin that give it a leathery appearance and that make it strong. Um, they're also a little bit unusual in that they mainly eat jellyfish. So their, their nesting sites are sort of, if you're thinking about leatherbacks, you're maybe thinking, or sea turtles in general, you're maybe thinking that they're mostly found in tropical regions. Um, and that's where their nesting sites are, usually in, in tropical beach areas. But they move to more temperate waters in the summertime. And so they can actually be spotted all along the coast of California. And probably your best bet to see them um, around here is in Monterey Bay, but it's probably easier to see one if you're in a boat. So I don't know if you have a good chance of seeing one from land. Um, all sea turtles are considered threatened at the international level. And there are many, many conservation management programs all around the world that are aiming to protect these really amazing and unique animals. Um, okay, another Bay Area favorite is the rubber boa. So the rubber boa is a pretty small, kind of chunky snake that has this loose, wrinkly skin and it looks a little bit rubbery. And boas are one of the more ancient groups of snakes. And the males actually have these tiny little spurs, they're called, on the side of the cloaca. So the cloaca is sort of the, the opening that serves all purposes um, for sort of the back end business of the snake. Um, so on either side of that opening, um, there are these little spurs in males. And those spurs are actually the vestigial limbs or the sort of leftover pelvis and femur bones that um, are, are used during mating, but they're not functional in the same way that, that a pelvis and femur would be in an animal that has legs. Um, so I think it's cool because it kind of shows again, sort of the, the evolutionary history of snakes um, and that they're descended from animals that had four legs, but then as those uh, legs became smaller and smaller, they realized they could be just as successful without them. So for the most part, they've completely lost them, but our, our local boas and other boas and pythons around the world still have these little remnants of, of where their legs used to be. Um, and what I like about rubber boas is they're a pretty calm species and their venom isn't harmful to humans. So they're a good starter snake to see for people who are a little bit nervous around snakes. Um, they're pretty common to find in the Bay Area in a variety of habitats. And your best bet to find one is by turning over logs and other sort of cover objects. So like old plywood or pieces of metal that you might see while you're hiking. Um, and if you do want to do this, please be sure to put the logs back or the cover objects back exactly how you found them because there's a lot of biodiversity that relies on the very special microclimate that's underneath these objects. Um, but it's it's a cool way to see um, snakes and, and other small critters like scorpions and all kinds of stuff. It's like a whole, it's a whole universe if you start flipping logs. <laughs> um, salamanders, yeah, you'll find all kinds of things. Um, and then some people will also get lucky and see them crossing the road or the trail in the early evening. Um, so if, if you're driving, it's always a good idea to keep an eye out for things in the road. Um, and snakes in particular really like to come out and bask on the road in the early evening. And unfortunately, because of that, um, a lot of them will get run over. So if, if you're driving and see a snake in the road, please do your best to avoid it. And if you think you can do so safely, you can sort of encourage it off the road as well. Um, and then the final local reptile I want to tell you about is the Blainville's horn lizard. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, horn lizards are sometimes called horny toads, but of course they're reptiles, not amphibians. Um, there are several species in this group, and they all have this sort of flat, round, pancake-shaped body and a crown of horns on their head. Um, I think they're adorable. I think they look like sort of mini triceratops dinosaurs. Um, and so they, they like to live typically in more dry, sandy habitats. 
and they almost exclusively eat ants. Um, and so they, you can also find them near, near anthills in these sandy areas. So one really um, surprising and unusual defense strategy that, that many of the species in this group has, um, they can shoot blood out of a special pocket from the corner of their eye to startle predators, which understandably is, is very startling <laughs> to predators. Um, so yeah, you can find videos of this online. Um, there are a few populations of this particular species in the Bay Area, including around Mount Diablo. Um, and you can see them, again, sort of in these more sandy little patches, so sandy washes. Um, and if, in particular, if you're in a sandy area and you see an anthill then, or a sort of a, a train of ants, then you should definitely keep an eye out for uh, a horned lizard. And this is also a, a species of special concern in California. So I don't have time to talk about all the amphibians and reptiles or even all the amphibians and reptiles that we can find here in the Bay Area, but these are some great resources if you'd like to learn more. So Amphibia Web um, is the, the website that keeps track of how many species there are and also has in-depth um, information about a bunch of the species. So many of the species have their own web page on Amphibia Web with a bunch of information and photos. Um, the reptile database is sort of the reptile version of that, but it's a little more sciencey and it doesn't have as much um, in terms of like photos and more natural history information, but it's still a really helpful resource. Uh, Life in Cold Blood, even though I don't like that it has cold blood in the title, is a really amazing uh, series from BBC that has some beautiful, beautiful um, videography capturing some of the really interesting behaviors of amphibians and reptiles. And so I think it's a great series if you're interested in learning more about sort of the parts of amphibian and reptile biology that we don't learn in school. Um, and then I always suggest getting a local field guide. Um, so the Peterson guides are great if you want to have in-depth information about our local species and they're, they're small enough to take with you on a hike. So that if you do come across a species, you can try to figure out which one it is and learn more about its, its biology. Um, and then if you're interested in seeing any of the species I talked about today or also other species in the Bay Area, uh, iNaturalist is a really great tool for doing this. So iNaturalist is a, a free website and also an app that you can search a region or a species and you'll get information about the community's observations of when and where they've seen that particular species or if you're going on a hike to a new area and you want to figure out what um, species you might encounter while you're there, you can just sort of draw a square around the place you'll be hiking and then see what people have seen there either recently or ever um, to sort of give you a heads up on what to keep an eye out for. Um, so I think this is a great tool if in particular, if you want to see particular species in your area. Um, and then I mentioned that many of the species in the Bay Area, and this was just a, a subset of the ones, but many of them are species of special concern or are formally listed as endangered. And unfortunately, this is true um, across North America and across much of the world. We're seeing really severe and concerning declines in amphibians, um, but also increasingly in reptiles. And both of these groups are really vulnerable to things like habitat loss and disease. And they're also very vulnerable to global change and climate change in particular. So amphibians, because of their reliance on um, water in many cases to complete their life cycle, as climate change is impacting the severity of droughts and also sort of the predictability of, of the rainy season. This can be a big challenge for species that need to time their reproduction with the climatic conditions. Um, and then with reptiles, because they are um, warming up their bodies with the sun um, and, and don't have as much control sort of over when and where they're, they're going to be active as birds and mammals do because of this need to warm up their bodies with the environment. 
Um, in certain parts of the world, we're seeing that they're going to be very, very vulnerable to increases in temperature and that this is going to impact how often um, and sort of what times of day they can be out and about and active because they can overheat. Um, and, and so it's potentially going to have major impacts on their ability to forage um, and, and complete parts of their daily routines. So a little bit of a, a somber note to end on, um, but I did want to highlight something that anyone can participate in um, to sort of help document our local biodiversity and also to play a role in documenting how biodiversity is being impacted by global change. And that's this yearly event called the City Nature Challenge. Um, so the next one is going to be in April and May of 2024. And this is a program where it uses iNaturalist, so that same website or, website or app that I was just describing. Um, and really the idea is during that first week to just go out, it can be your local park, you can do an urban version of this, it doesn't have to be in sort of a more typical natural area, and just document anything and everything that you see that is uh, plants and animals and, and, and mushrooms, but biological. Um, so making observations, taking pictures on your phone through the app, and then uploading it into the database. And then the second week, experts from all around the world will help to identify what you've seen. So you don't even have to know what you're taking a picture of, or you just upload it, and then an expert is going to tell you what it is, which is also pretty cool. Um, and then this is happening all around the world simultaneously, and it's been happening for several years now. Um, and scientists use this data. And so every year that we're adding to this sort of global database of the state of biodiversity at a particular moment in time is adding to this sort of monitoring effort so that we can track how species and their behavior are changing as our planet is changing. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great way to get out and learn more about the biodiversity in your backyard. Um, and it's also a great way to contribute to this global effort for us to all play a role in documenting how our planet is changing um, and, and for those data to be used in conservation management and planning. So um, that's all I have for you today. And I'd be happy to take a few questions if there's time. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Bell. So much information. Um, thank you, I mean, as we're looking at it, just some of the misconceptions that we have about um, even just referencing the, the um, phylogenetic tree, right? How we're looking at how we examine things and learning about Sicilians and learning about our local animals. Um, you know, we have a, a few questions. I think I kind of try to jam at a few of these that are a little bit specific, but um, just to, for the sake of time, and I know we're kind of coming to the end. Um, I think the remaining questions, a couple of remaining questions can be answered by your the links that you have. So you had some great links, so we'll send people that direction. But I guess a, a one last question kind of to leave you with or leave us with is, what, you know, given all the work that you're doing and have been doing for a number of years, what is, you know, what brings you hope? What, what environmental work or, you know, what you're seeing? What are the things, I know there's a lot for us to say is grim, um, but what brings you hope? as you're doing your research or you're doing it? Um, that's a good question. And I think it is it is important to maintain hope because otherwise it's easy to get into this sort of like doom spiral of why even bother? <laughs> um, and I think for me, so a lot of the work that I do is on islands and islands tend to be particularly impacted by things like habitat loss and invasive species. And so, and many of the species on islands are endemic, which means they're not found anywhere else in the world. So if we lose them on that island, they're gone, it's over. Uh, and so because of that, island species are in big trouble all around the world. So it's sort of like the most doomsday scenario is species on islands. Um, but what's really hopeful, I think, is there are many cases in which these relatively small but very focused actions like 
getting rid of the invasive rats or getting rid of the goats that are, you know, chomping down all the native plants, getting rid of those invasive species, you can see the sort of reversal of all that decline within just a few years. Mm -hmm. And so by act, like figuring out what species need to be able to thrive and to, to continue on sort of their, their trajectory, their sort of daily, yearly, centuries long trajectory on this planet, if we can actually do whatever the thing is that is needed for them. So if it's get rid of the invasive species or make sure that we're closing down the, the road during the annual migration of the California newts, these like kind of minor things in the in like in the grand scheme of like, oh my God, everything's can't be fixed. And like we're just, you know, headed down this doom spiral. We can see really dramatic impacts, really dramatic improvements in a short amount of time. And so I think it's helpful to remember that amphibians, for example, have been on this planet for over 300 million years. And so they are sensitive. They are sort of the canary in the coal mine, but they've also been through a lot. And so they have resilience. They have the ability to adapt, but they need a little bit of a boost in certain areas. Like if all the salamanders are getting run over on their way to breed every year, they're not going to make it, right? So if we can just identify what these these solutions are that need to be implemented and then actually implement them, species do bounce back. And so I think that's really encouraging. Actually, that's such a powerful message, right? I mean, that idea of microcosm by micro, like these, especially when you think of an island that we're starting so small, or you're talking about the the yeah. migration, the breeding migrations, and just bit like each of us in our small, I mean, we talk about that when we're thinking about um, when we're looking at, you know, arthropods or we're talking about, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. It's like your piece, whatever piece, you know, you do your piece and you can, what is totally. that all we can or like say? planting milkweeds in your garden to support yeah. monarch, you know, like and it, it does matter. It does help. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Piece by piece. Yeah. Well, certainly all the work you're doing is, is making a huge impact. And we're so thankful that you took this time here to talk with us and educate this population all of us who are tuning in to this as well. Yeah, so for those of you who are still sticking with us, um, thank you so much for being here and we will send a follow-up email. So please share this. We will, um, I mean, the hope here is that this information, if it's interesting to you, will be interesting and and something, you know, the, the powerful collection of just learning about our local ecosystem and learning about um, the, you know, how we can be recording things and learning about things together. Um, please share. Um, and thank you for your continued support through Dynation. This continues to be critical funding to run these programs, both this free community webinar series, also funding supports the Junior Land Stewards Program, which is, you know, getting students from CUSD out there developing those skills and desires to become these lifelong stewards of the land. Um, we have, uh, we'll be doing our next webinar in January. We have um, uh, excited, we will be up on the website very soon, but we have some folks from San Mateo Research Con Resource Conservation District um, will be coming at the end of January to talk about anadromous fish. So very, very interesting. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bell. And um, we will see many of you again, hopefully in a couple of months. All right, thank you.